Hey, you're listening to The Centre Podcast. We're a church based in Dural, Sydney, who love Jesus and so want to make Him the centre of our lives, our community and our world. We're going to learn how to do that right now as we sit down and unpack Sunday's sermon. Well, welcome once more to Banter. We are coming back and reflecting on Easter. Uh, It's been a massive week. Mitch, how you doing, man? I'm well. Very well. It's probably the latest Banter we've ever recorded. We might be setting a record here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) What's your week been like, mate? Uh, Short. Yeah. Because of the public holiday. Yeah. (laughs) That's really it. So short. Yeah, um, yeah, Easter was great. Really good time just to, yeah. Unplug and mm. refresh, mm. And, um, yeah, uh, over reflecting on the death and resurrection of Jesus. So yeah, good. Can't complain. What's your What's your favorite Easter egg, mate? What oh, do you, what do you like? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Um, what they called the little creamy cream, cream eggs. Egg, yeah, yeah. I always want to love the cream eggs when I get them. I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be great, and then I'm always just like, I don't know. <laughs> just, <laughs> I don't. I I don't know what the cream is. Like, I know what the yolk is. It's like caramel. Yeah. That cream, creamy sugar stuff. I don't feel like anybody ever wants them any other <laughs> time of year. <laughs> but it is, it's a nice novelty. I yeah. I think that's, it's the special thing. It's mm. sort of become like a, another hot cross bun or something. This special thing. You get yeah. I ate far too much chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> I was just there. I just keep eating it. Is it. Tricky. Yeah. It's, it's tricky when they're such small mouthfuls. You're just like, ah, oh, it's just a single, oh, how, yeah. it's just a tiny piece of chocolate, but it all adds up very does, quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I can't go past Turkish delight, which okay. the the Turkish delight like little the Cadbury oh, okay. Easter eggs. Yeah, they're, it's not real Turkish delight. Yeah, okay. It's like a, a Turkish delight flavored gel. <laughs> yeah, <I guess> so. <laughs> but it's great. I love the rose water and I don't know whatever else is going on in it. Oh, it takes yeah. me back to you know my time in Turkey or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Love all Turkish delight. Well, we, um, I mean, look, we're not far from Turkey on this scene of yeah. the resurrection here. Yeah, it's a good segue. Uh, thanks. It's not my best, but it's okay. It's Friday. Um, we, yeah, had this opportunity to reflect on the death and resurrection of mm. Christ on our Easter Friday or Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Mm. And yeah, as always, Mitch, just making us think about <laughs> why is the resurrection important? Why does it matter? Um, yeah, let's let's talk about that for a second mm. first, because I think that there's a lot to unpack just in that. Yeah. Why? Um, so you you sort of put forth on Sunday, and I, I agree. I think you're right that the resurrection is so important to our faith. Mm. Why do you think we, as a church, as Christians, don't fully understand the ramifications of the resurrection? Why is it not really the focal point of our faith? Mm. Mm. Um. I think part of that is to do with church history mm. as the church became increasingly Greek. Those Greek, what they call platonic ideas, came mm. forth and say so you had this view that the spiritual was more holy or better than the physical. Mm-hmm. And so as yeah, the Jewish sort of way of thinking, which celebrated God as a good creator and salvation being tied in with creation, it came more and more about the, the spiritual. And so I think for... Particularly in the world I grew up in, I remember singing a song at Sunday school. Um, Yeah, I'm going to a place somewhere in outer space. The countdown's getting closer. We're doing 10, 9, 8, 6, and 7. Yeah, and that was how it went. It was probably written around when the NASA space race was on. But but that was the idea. Was Yeah, Jesus' resurrection was never tied in with, yeah, he's alive, and then we go to heaven. Yeah. And I think the language, particularly in Matthew's gospel of the kingdom of heaven, sort of perpetuates this idea of heaven's up there, not down here. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yeah, and I remember the only time I'd encountered this sort of concept of bodily resurrection was through um, Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm like, well, that's a cult. And so it was quite mm. dismissive of yeah that idea. They do at focus all. a lot on, on that. That's, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I won't go into that. But so that was part of like, well, that's they're wrong. So therefore, like, I had this view yeah. for a long time. It's only really yeah. in my recent, probably last really eight to ten years that yeah. oh, it's actually yeah bodily that where Jesus' resurrection is, as the apostle Paul said, is the first fruits of a greater harvest mm. to come. And so, what happened to Jesus? He died. 
his spirit goes into paradise as he tells the sure. thief on the cross, yeah, so yeah, to yeah. speak. Yeah. Um, and then he's bodily resurrected. Mm. And as I started exploring um, the Hebraic mindset more and more, just mm. kept coming back to the importance of being made in the image of God. Mm. Humans are the pinnacle of God's mm. creation. We are the only ones that, yeah, yeah God's God's image. We are that. Literally, you can translate it as idol of God. Salam. It's an interesting yeah. way. That's a, that's a much more like yeah. confronting. Yeah, way. Yeah. So the image idol of God. It's we like are the confusing. idol of God. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. And, it, and to be, particularly in the the Jewish mindset, to be human is to have nepesh and flesh. Mm. And so that's what Jesus has done. He has restored. Yeah, humans can one day eat from the tree of life. The nepesh will not leave them. The life breath will not mm. escape death. No longer has a hold on us. And the other thing too is, like, yeah, it was kind of jumping to the end there. That Michael Horton quote that that was one of those moments where I was like, oh, I never grasped the significance of how evil death is. Mm. So I had a real like very like ah yeah like my dad's attitude was ah yeah just stick me in a hole who cares I've gone to heaven don't don't worry about death that's yeah. da, da, da. it was kind of real attitude it's like oh who cares why would you be sad mm-hmm. and Horton yeah as I quoted on Sunday he's downplaying the seriousness of the foe only trivializes the debt that was paid and the conquest that was achieved at the cross and the empty tomb and he in his chapter he reiterates this this is an enemy death is an enemy mm-hmm. against God's purposes mm-hmm. like, oh like it just sort of it kind of just becomes part of the natural order of things that oh, we're meant to die, but yeah, yeah, frame around that way is that uh, well, death is unnatural. God's intention was for humans to live in flourishing, mm-hmm. for us to be mm-hmm. in these bodies, yeah. um, which is why Psalm eight is it's like, well, you know, you've made this whole world, and yet what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You yeah. made him for a little while lower than the angels, and yet he's he crowned us with glory and honor and given everything under your feet. Like why, why us? Mm. And that's what Jesus has done for us is yeah. by being resurrected, we live in the way that God intended mm. as image bearers without sin mm. or death. So that's a very long ended way of saying and, why and resurrection no. is important. And look, you've given us lots of little Easter eggs along the way <laughs> yeah. there, you know, like a little, you know, tuxedoed bunny. Yeah. But I think that one thing that I want to quickly pick up mm. on, because it might be a point of interest for people, mm. is you spoke about um, Jesus's use of the phrase kingdom of heaven mm. in Matthew's gospel. It may have been something that we've mentioned before, but might be worthwhile reminding people. Why is it that in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses this phraseology mm. of kingdom of heaven when the four other gospels, he seems to say kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, the Jews didn't like using God's name, so they would... Like, yeah, avoid saying God directly. See, even if you go on like Jewish sites today, they'll just have God with G, like a little space yeah. and D. Yeah. Um, so it's a way of sort of circumnavigating using God's name. And yeah. tied in with the Ten Commandments about misusing the name of yeah. Yahweh, your yeah. God. And yeah. so, yeah, they would often Jews would refer to God as the yeah. name or Lord. Yeah. Which I think, I I mean, it in and of itself sort of points towards a really important distinction because obviously, you know, Matthew is writing to a predominantly Jewish Mm. audience. So he decides to use this slightly different phraseology that they would have understood. Cool. Same idea. Yeah. Kingdom of heaven. And really even the idea that the kingdom of God, well, we see right in the beginning in Genesis, like Mm. God creates the heavens and the earth mm. <laughs> and all of it is his kingdom yep. so this idea when Jesus is saying the kingdom of God it actually isn't exclusive to heaven no. the idea that God is sovereign over the earth as well and that is part of his kingdom mm. so straight away even in that phraseology it's really interesting that we get this sort of um, I guess you know alternative to a platonic dualism where yeah. you've got you know heaven good earth bad yeah. spirit good flesh yeah. bad um, so let's let's hop into it. The image of God. It yeah. is honestly, I think we we could do a whole sermon series on the you image could. of God. Um, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you could. Oh, it's it's remarkably um, in depth. So I I'll, might read just the context in Genesis chapter one. Um, so I'm from verse twenty six. Then God said, "Let us make mankind in our image." Which that's just. So much debate about what does that mean? <laughs> who is us? Yeah, yeah, who is us? Um, in our image, in our likeness, so that um, they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over 
the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. Everything that has breath of life, that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant of food. And it was so. Mm. Yeah. That's the question. What do you notice in that? What's what's the theme around what humans are going to do? Um, I, I guess to to keep, to to, mm. to maintain, to yeah, create order over. Mm. Um, what's the word that you notice gets repeated again and again and again? Well, breath of life is is something that keeps on coming up there, mm. but I feel like I'm not saying the right no. thing. No, <laughs> <laughs> it starts with R, N Z E. Rule, rule, rule. rule. There we go. Yeah. We got there. We got there rule. eventually. I'm sorry, Mitch. That's I really, right. I dropped the ball there. That's oh, okay. I was trying to, you know. <laughs> Educational sort of technique. You, you set me know, up for a spike to... and I, 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 I balls it <laughs> up. I'm so trying to, you know, I like to do this so then people, I feel like with learning, if people can kind of come to the conclusion themselves better than just being told sometimes. It, 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 is, like, it is a great form of teaching. <laughs> that's what I like to do. I'm like, oh, is there anything that means? Oh, okay, you got it. Um, yeah, was, so, what I was doing is I knew that. I knew <laughs> okay, that. I was just... letting people at home, I was oh, giving them stuff, yeah, go, yeah, no, good. Murray, rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, rule, Murray, rule. rule. So you're welcome, guys. <laughs> Don't mention it. I got you back. So, yeah, that. Um, so there's sort of three views on what the image of God is. And the summary is, the first view is something that's called the substantive or the structural view. So image of God means that humans have a psychological or the, the spiritual makeup. And so I guess it's about the soul. That human, yeah. The difference between humans and animals is our soul. Um, yeah, and our soul enables us to love, to you know understand virtue and holiness. So that's sort of one view that's view number one view number one so what's called the we have a soul and animals don't don't. yeah cool um view number two is what's called the relational view um so this view agrees with the um structural substantive view but argues that a person must be in relationship with god to truly possess the image of god Hmm. um or others say yeah this relational view is that it gives us the ability to establish relations on a spiritual and physical level so on a physical level would be marriage or spiritual of their relationship with god and so i don't see these two views as being wrong but maybe a little bit deficient mm-hmm. so speaker like yeah okay it's right but probably not fully and what what i was getting at with that what do you know about rule is the third view is what's known as the functional view and so the role that humans have is to rule over the earth. Mm. And that's what seems to come up. That seems to be the the theme of the Old Testament and Genesis is Mm. humans um, were created, Adam and Eve were created to be priests and and royalty. That's a better word, dignity. Royalty in in the garden. Um, Actually reading a book, I mentioned that last week, on the theology of Melchizedek Mm. and so building up Adam's the first priest king, and he fails that. Noah takes on a role as a priest king. Abraham, Moses to an extent, and David. Mm. Actually, that ties in well with the kingdom of God because David, that's the hope of Israel, is the Davidic covenant. is this one, this son of David, who Mm. will have an everlasting kingdom. Mm. And so, one who will conquer all of God's enemies. And that ties in with Melchizedek, because Psalm 110 is, the Lord said to my Lord, said to my right hand, I'll make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And this idea, this Melchizedek, high priest who's a king will defeat God's enemies and mm. make them a footstool. Mm. And then, yeah, when he's victorious, you know, they can drink from a brook. That's how the psalm ends. Yeah, it's yeah, a bit yeah. odd, but yeah, yeah. seems to be, yeah, it's a bit like a sort of Samson. You know, after battle, he drinks water, showing yeah. a way of being victorious. This idea is tied in there. And that's what, yeah, I think is a more comprehensive view as this functional view is that God is essentially, let's just use, um, yeah, property terms. God is the landlord. He is the mm. divine landlord. He owns the property, mm. which is the cosmos, mm. and part of that is the earth. And He's given rule, ruleship, ruling over the earth. And that's what it means to be image bearers: is to have this aspect of God where ruling and subduing is part of that. Over, and it's comprehensive. You know, they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals. 
And in biblical text, when there's repetition, it mm-hmm. shows that there's importance. So you got verse 26 is God speaking when it's amongst himself or the angels. There's a bit of debate about that where it's God speaking in mm-hmm. a Trinitarian sort of form, the let us. Sure. And then he repeats that commandment to humans. And so Genesis is showing this is so important about the ruling of humans that it, we're not gonna, just going to say it once about God speaking mm. amongst himself mm. about how important this rule will be for humans. And then we're going to repeat in the text to God's words to humans. So mm. there's a repetition, and repetition shows that, yeah, when you want to make sure someone gets something, you repeat it. So mm. it seems to be showing this idea here about ruling is really important. That's what being image bearers of God, part of that is that ruling as God intended. And we're... Mm. Um, Christopher Wright, in his book, Old Testament Ethics for the People of God, um, he m- argues that um, Genesis, oh, Genesis, that Eden is a temple. Mm. And so, like all temples, they should be filled with um, images, salam, images or idols. And so if you stepped into an ancient Near Eastern temple, you would see an image. And on the PowerPoint I've got, which you can't see, there's a little image of Baal. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, that would be walk into a temple of Baal and say, oh, that's what, this is a temple of Baal. Yeah. That's the image. And that image was meant to represent the characteristics of Baal. Baal's a storm god. god. Yeah. Baal's a superior god in Canaan's mythology. And so whatever, you know, whatever temple you stepped in, that's what you're meant to do. God doesn't have images. We're forbidden expressly to make an image of God, mm. but humans carry that. And so mm. in this temple, garden he creates god creates images living images of himself as a way of showing so every time i look at you or you look at me it's like oh you're in the image of god mm. that's meant to remind us okay and it's not just man it's also woman which mm. is also quite profound for yeah. the ancient world it's yeah both man and woman share this image of god this this ruling characteristic which yeah is part of us um you know, to look at each other and think, oh, God's in charge of this world. And we, yeah, play a, a role on the physical mm. domain of this mm. world, of like caring for this temple space, this mm. sacred space. And so, yeah, I found that a really helpful yeah, understanding of what being the image of God is. Yeah, sure. Um, Probably the idea of a soul. And soul, unfortunately, probably have more of a Greek view mm-hmm. of the idea of soul. Mm-hmm. So that's why I like the word nepesh beva we're living yeah. being where yeah so i guess spirit soul uh, yeah it just says a lot of baggage with the word soul so it's not yeah. in itself a bad word it just is we probably carry the wrong idea yeah. probably more of a greek view of well soul. yeah i mean the, the greek <laughs> word like suke yeah it's sort of like it's soul but it's also mind like yeah. where you get the word psyche yeah. from so it is like even in that idea even within that greek yeah. context of the new testament like when they're saying soul it's really like mind a little bit as well your personality yeah it's that idea um rather than you know some mysterious ghost blob that's that's floating somewhere inside of you that escapes out your mouth when you die yeah that's why i like nepesh um literally if you want to learn more about the word i encourage you to watch the bible project video on nepesh the word literally just means throat which yeah yeah, that's quite profound in itself the Mm. literal meaning is throat but we it's used in the bible talk about giving like the life breath the energy Why do you find that profound with the throat? Um, Because just how simple it is. Mm. How literally just means throat and uh, goes in, so spirit uh, in, Mm. comes out death. Mm. Um, Profound in the sense of I just love the simplicity of the Hebrew language. Mm. (laughs) It just makes things so. Yeah, um, I have. I wonder if I could find it. When I was at the school, um, I taught a couple of terms on what they called Christian studies. And one of the lessons we looked at the difference between Hebraic and Greek thinking, and I looked at a few words. Oh, I can't remember them off the top of my head. This one, right? oh, here we go. Yeah, action and feeling words. So, just the differences in Hebrew. Hebrew is a very like action-based language, yeah. and so almost childlike in how to describe things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to look is to lift up the eye. Now, if you translate that directly, we kind of understand that, but like you wouldn't write. You know, Abraham lifted up the eye. That's just a bit clunky in English, mm. but it shows you there's something really like lifting mm. his eye up. Anger is to flare or burn one's nostril. Like yeah. how much more? It's just okay. Yeah. 
if you said, yeah, there's that, that classic um, quote, um, let's say, the Lord, the Lord's slow, um, yeah, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger. If you said, you know, Yahweh, yeah. Yahweh, gracious and compassionate, slow to flare his nostrils, you'd be like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, doesn't we, it say long of nostrils? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This idea that he has long yeah, nostrils, nostrils, so he has his <laughs> patient. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it just would not make sense. So, yeah, revealing something is to unstop someone's ears, um, no compassion's hard heartedness. Stubborn, stiff-necked, that's one we've probably yeah, yeah, have, yeah. Has come across into our vocabulary. Yeah. But, yeah, it creates a real – it's a really picturesque language. Yeah. That's what I love about it. Um, mm. Yeah, gird your loins to get ready. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just these interesting ways it describes things, mm-hmm. um, yeah, using kind of concrete language. And that's yeah. what I love about um, that idea of nepesh, that yeah. literal meaning of throat Yeah, is the idea – Coming in, yeah. Coming out, yeah. yeah well, I like, it seems like so much more fragile in some ways. Mm. You know, it seems like it's something which is continually reliant on God. Mm. And I kind of love the way that it sort of brings in the often forgotten third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, mm. into it. God's breath. You know, mm. this image of God's spirit, God's breath, being so enacted and living and almost physicalized in that mm. idea, now dwelling within us, yeah. this idea that, you know, God's breath is what gives life to Adam and now we can be filled with his spirit, yeah. um, that there's a, there's a life-giving essence to that. And, yeah, something which is continually reliant, I think, uh. is, is really deep and profound. Mm. So you kind of went uh, these these three different options for images Mm-mm-mm. of god um the first one being that we have a soul. soul yep now we've now kind of looked at this idea of you know nefesh mm. or suki um yep. now are we actually the only ones who have souls yeah that's a great question well um, let, let let me yeah, rephrase yeah, yeah. it are we the only ones that have nefesh nefesh no we don't um yeah and this is what's Interesting, particularly in Genesis 1 and 2. And that was the example I had on the slides on Sunday. And God said, let the waters teem with living creep- creatures. Nepesh chaya. I'll say it with the Aussie twang in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let the birds fly. Bye. But that, and that happens, that the animals are living creatures. And so um, yeah, where is... Let me whip up Genesis chapter 2 so I can look at it properly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Genesis 1 and 2 are... Um, yeah, obviously Genesis one's you know the seven days of creation. Genesis two is sort of a I guess what they call a tolled off, a zoomed in focus mm-hmm. on um, six days. So sort of a different I guess angle on the six day account. And so yeah, we're, we're told here um, about yeah the only thing that's not good um, in the garden. It's not good. This is verse eighteen of chapter two. It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, how that beautifully sets up tension in the narrative, particularly for an original Israelite reader who would have been familiar with a number of the other creation mythologies mm-hmm. that were floating around, mm-hmm. is that in a number of them, humans find their companionship with animals. Mm-hmm. And so here's the, the great tension is that both humans and animals f- form from the dust of the ground have nepesh are called living beings <laughs> so you're like oh where's that i'm gonna find his companion and it's yeah. not in sort of you know a donkey or a cow it's in uh, a woman yeah. and it's really only probably time in hebrew and english actually the the rhymes work so hebrew word for man is can be adam but another way is is mm. and woman is isa mm. and so yeah so from is comes isa woman yeah, yeah. and yeah and Oh, we sort of, you know, know the story well. Adam has no suitable helper, so goes into a deep sleep. And yeah, the word rib, it could also mean side. Um, John Walton reckons it's like half, mm. like it's it's a fatal wound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like a a, yeah. a death. So it's something they should give him death. Mm. Brings life Ooh. to Eve, Oof. and then that ties in really well with his, um Jesus getting. His side pierced mm-hmm. and the water and blood coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, a few ancient um, like Christian commentators made that link between mm-hmm. Jesus' blood, like the side, because side mison, I guess the Greek word, it's yeah. used here in um, yeah. Genesis two and uh, John, yeah. Je- and John's account yeah. of the crucifixion is, yeah, Jesus making a bride at mm-hmm. that moment, mm-hmm. and so yeah, it's a really cool interplay there, and 
Yeah, the rabbis would say woman's not formed from his head, so she's superior to him, or his feet to be inferior, but from his side to be mm. his equal. And mm. yeah, um, yeah, even the word helper, some people think, well, that's a diminutive task, but God's mm. also called an ezer. That's the Hebrew word, ezer, helper. Yeah. The like, advocate, yeah, the helper. Yeah, 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 yeah helper. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, the Lord is my, my helper, my yeah, strength. Yeah, like, yeah. you don't think God is being weak. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, anyway. Not sure we got into that, but anyway, that no, sort no, of no. Some, that sort of ties in yeah, this yeah. whole image of God yeah. and how men and women yeah. share that. And I guess too, like another way, if you look at women, like women are the only humans that have creative capacities within them, the sure. wombs, which is what, yeah, they bring forth life. Mm. Unlike men, men don't have that capacity mm. to bring forth mm. babies. So mm. there's a, and then what's cool is that, um, well, obviously in marriage, two become one, and then having a child. The child and the woman are one. Mm. So there's sort of this passing on about marriage sort of mm. brings humans back yeah. to their original state, which was one. Yeah. And then from that, you've got one woman with her. And so yeah. there's a, like, there's a kind of cool yeah, yeah, like yeah. flow on effect. Yeah, it's that. then sort of like a child mm. comes out of yeah. her side. Yeah. yeah. That kind of thing. Mm. And then so I think where, we, where we're coming from that is yep. the idea that Nefes Shaya, there's yep. ideas that there's all these animals yep. that are filled with God's yeah, yeah, breath but, as well yeah. and are living beings um, so then yeah for, for this substant, substantive or substantial yeah, substantive, view, substantive, yeah. whatever yeah, view yeah. number one yeah, is yeah, of yeah, an image of yeah. God um, so yeah that this idea of ruling really is the thing that sets apart yeah. is there maybe a suggestion that in a physical form in some way even though God doesn't have a physical form there's something that I mean Jesus took on yeah. human flesh he didn't take on like donkey flesh yeah. or it's, eagle flesh yeah. he chose human flesh this idea that there is something about our our humanity mm. our being our sort of you know homo sapien yeah, yeah, form yeah, yeah. that is a bear, an image bearer mm. of god or is that maybe yeah, look, missing the point well i would say god's spirit and God's, I guess, genderless in some mm. ways. Like sure. we, we use father and he predominantly. Yeah. yeah. Um, no chromosomes. No yeah. 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 But the Bible uses anthropomorphic, which is just a fancy way of yeah. saying human-like characteristics yeah. to describe it. So in Genesis 3, God's walking through the garden. Mm. And so it's, it's hard to know, is God in that way because we're created that way or is God like that? Before, so mm. I don't know, but yeah. the Bible points to God having certainly these anthropomorphic mm. characteristics. Yeah. Um, sometimes, yeah, not all the time. So sometimes God appears as well to Moses as a fire. Yeah. Um, other times we meet him mysteriously as a figure called the Angel of Yahweh, and you're yeah. like, is this an angel? Or is this this God? Like when we did our Trinity series yeah. about the shifting sort of Yahweh to the angels. So yeah, yeah like Abraham's three mysterious visitors. Yeah. Two of them are definitely angels who go down to Sodom. And then the third one, Abraham like, negotiates with, and it's clearly Yahweh. Mm. And you're reading, you're like, hang on, this is saying the Lord, like in capitals, mm. Yahweh, but this is a person? Mm. And you're like, oh, mm. there's something deep and mysterious going on. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. And the answer to that is yes yeah. and yeah, we don't well, know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Is it this or this? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so really this idea then is really profound when we start to think of our sort of commission as Christians to be Christ-like, mm. to be image bearers of yep. Christ. That That is like really our, our first commission in the very beginning of Genesis, that it is Adam and Eve's job to be image bearers of God. Mm. And now our commission to be image bearers of God, you know, through the example that Christ has set for us, it really does you know show from the very beginning this importance now we sort of you know w want to spend some time obviously on the on the resurrection because mm. this was what we were <laughs> kind of getting into today yeah. but i think that there is so much there and there is so much profound depth yeah. and uh, i think um yeah value in just going yeah. down i think part. for me the I asked a couple of times well what is the point of the resurrection i feel like unless you have like a grounding in creation that's just lost like yep. those key points of being created in the image of God, being called to serve and protect the garden, to be kings and queens over the earth and priesthood. Like we, if you don't understand that, it makes sort of Jesus' role as bringing in the kingdom, being the perfect human to rule over the world. Mm -hmm. And this is Adam was supposed to be. Paul calls Jesus the last Adam. Yeah. Like that's so. If you don't understand Genesis one to three, 
the resurrection's not as significant mm. because you're missing sort of it's kind of like having a parts of puzzle missing like yeah I can understand it but mm. you need to get mm. the puzzle pieces fully mm. to appreciate the picture yeah I remember my little brother had a where's Wally puzzle once and he lost the piece that had Wally on it <laughs> I feel like that's kind of what it is <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, like yeah. you're kind of missing the piece that has yeah, Wally yeah. on it like, the puzzle doesn't um, have yeah, any yeah, value yeah. anymore yeah. <laughs> so then okay cool so we kind of looked at this idea of, of salvation coming mm. through this that there is this symbolic death in Egypt mm. and then there is this continual we see this maybe theme of resurrection mm. of, of coming back through um, in, in different ways, not in a very literal physical form, but before, you know, God's ultimate resurrection mm. through Christ. Um, and this idea that then the resurrection is the ultimate, the pinnacle example of Jesus, God defeating mm. evil, defeating death, yep. as we've already said, you know, God is life. Mm. <laughs> so the antithesis of him in, in one part is death. Yep. Um, so to defeat death, to defeat evil. Um this this idea of a resurrection, the death of the enemy, what does this then inform us in our day-to-day walk? How does this change our praxis, mm. our, our daily sort of patterns of behavior? Mm. It's, a, it's a great question, Murray. Actually, part of it, what we're looking at on Sunday, on a sermon called Practice Resurrection. Yeah. Um, so a big part of it, I'm kind of spoilers for next Sunday. Um, Peter, as we're looking at one, Peter talks about we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade away. This mm-hmm. this idea of this inheritance is based on our living hope, which is mm-hmm. tied in with Jesus' resurrection. Mm-hmm. And we, we can cling on to the hope of Jesus, is what Peter's saying, because even though we're going to experience fiery mm-hmm. trials, which will test our mm-hmm. faith, that's what I see is the hope we're looking forward to and in one peter jesus peter gives us a model of jesus who when he's brought before the authorities he doesn't sort of retaliate he suffers injustice and persecution and we're called to do the same Mm. and so in a sense having this idea of the resurrection you start to frame your life around jesus yeah um so one peter 2 21 is for this you're called as um as Christ suffered, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Mm. That's the the idea that we're supposed to use. And you can take that idea with the resurrection as like, okay, for me, resurrection means vindication so I can endure hardship and pain like mm. Jesus, knowing that there's something future ahead. Mm. Um, so that's probably, that's like one way, that's one sort of strand of looking at that. For me, it's actually about celebrating the goodness of creation. Mm. There is... I've never met a person that's hated a beautiful sunset. Mm. Uh, like you'd have to be pretty cold, cold-hearted to say, oh, "I hate that was a terrible sunset." Or mm. like you like sunrising, you got these. It's just like an artwork in the sky of all the different colours, and if you have mm. got clouds in there, or you look up, particularly when you're out of the city, um, in the you know the sky, and you mm. see these stars or a full moon that mm. just is this like beautiful light. Oh yeah, laying from trees, plants. Flowers. There's something there that's it celebrates. It's a way of looking at the beauty of creation. Like that's just a foreshadowing of what is to come. Yeah. There's, yeah. yeah. We. Yeah. There's something just. Well, as Paul said to Timothy, everything God created is to be good and received with thanksgiving. He's talking in the context of food, but I think that can apply to yeah. all of life, all particularly things. out here in Dural. Like you look out at the trees, think there's just something so like calmful and peaceful about that. And something that humans, if you live about. Like trees or plants it does something to you like mm. this mm. it makes you go a bit mad which makes sense because we were created to live in nature mm. and in a garden space so that's one way of looking at it is this knowledge of hey what I really enjoy right now is going to be this is just a taste of what's going to be amplified mm. when the new heavens and the new earth mm. and Jesus mm. is ruling and reigning from yeah. Jerusalem so yeah yeah, and so that's probably why they're almost like two extremes. One side is to keep going during like suffering and pain, yeah. knowing that there's an end goal. Another way is to look at it as like, yeah, what you are enjoying right now mm. is yeah a foreshadowing of what is to come. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that it, it's it's sort of that response, isn't it? It's sort of a um, almost rebellion against like Platonic dualism. Mm. Of, no, actually, like 
the earth like has beauty the mm. earth like it is the same earth that god at the very beginning yeah. in genesis said was very good mm. you know when he looked at you know the, the the birds and the trees and the fruit he said it was all very good mm. including humans as yeah. well you know our bodies are, are very mm. good they are currently in a fallen state yeah. so sometimes my knees don't feel very good <laughs> you know sometimes i know my, my yeah. eyes don't feel very good but there is this idea that there is much mm. to be celebrated and i think that there has been um, maybe a little bit of a, you know, a, a lie put forth in culture that it's the secular world who enjoys the pleasure of yeah. the material and that, you know, Christians are, you know, sort of these people who just want to push back against any pleasure, mm. you know, don't want to celebrate the beauty in anything. Yeah. And it's like, well, like God owns beauty. Yeah. And <laughs> a big part of that is surround your eschatology. Yeah. If you have a belief that... And look, I will admit some of the language, it's hard to comment. Well, we had two Peter talks about the earth being burnt up with yeah. fire. And, and it seems like... God's gonna annihilate everything. So if you, mm. but if if you believe that God's gonna burn everything and destroy everything, yeah, it makes it like ah, oh, well, who cares? Yeah, like I've had people sort of say this sort of expression: "Why polish the brass of a sinking ship?" <laughs> you know, yeah, okay, there's some truth to that. I, I get that. Yeah, but we could argue the same thing. Well, why are we called to live like? sanctified lives like why do we strive for discipleship like yeah. well, there's something about our bodies yeah and paul talks a bit about this in 1 corinthians 6 this why you have to be sexually pure is like unlike other sins sex does something inside of our bodies and we're reading kenneth bailey sort of saying almost like yeah i don't know if he really meant this but he so sort it of says essentially along the lines of we perhaps carry some of the scars of our sins into the next Lifetime, like that's what he was sort of. That's one of his suggestions about what Paul meant. Like, as Jesus still has the scars sure. of the, so sure. yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's like it, but there's certainly something there of like, well, we each week we encourage people to live more faithfully for Jesus, and if yeah. we really didn't matter about our bodies, why would we care? If we're just going to die and go to heaven, so who yeah. kind of cares? Um, the reality is, is that we're called to, we've been called to rule over the earth, to steward it. Mm -hmm. um, to rule in a way that mirrors God's mm. sort of rule, mm. um, like a shepherd. Um, yeah, because you can read that language in Genesis and think, well, ruling means that we can sort of exploit. Yeah. Um, yeah kings in the ancient world were meant to be shepherds. Mm. Um, so this is, again, from Christopher Wright in his book, Old Testament Ethics. Great book. Mm. Highly recommend it. It's a bit fat, but it's a great book. Yeah, and he yeah, talks yeah. about this a lot, about yeah, the ideal king was meant mm. to be a shepherd, one who cares. So, And we see that ultimately reflected in Jesus. He is a mm. king who is a shepherd. Mm. And so as humans, that's a similar calling mm. that we have. Um, for, for me, I look at um, the miracles that Jesus performed on people as again, signposts, to use that language yeah. of NT, right? Yeah. Of what the, the kingdom will look like. Yeah. And so, which is interesting. Last night we watched one of the stories of the Bible about Jesus healing the paralytic. Mm. And he was like, why did he heal him? and try to explain to a four-year-old about I say, like, well, the healing is meant to point to, you know, what yeah. God will do in the future. And so yeah. for Jesus, healing people was very important. If you read through the Gospels, it's a fair chunk. Particularly Mark is a fair chunk of it just dedicated to yeah. Jesus performing exorcisms, yeah. healing people. Yeah. Feeding people. Feeding, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Caring for the body. Yeah. And then and then tidying on that too, um, resurrecting some people, so yeah. Jairus's daughter, sure. um, the the widow's son in Nain, uh, even the early church, like you got Dorcas, what an unfortunate name, Dorcas or Tabitha, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Peter, yeah, yeah. healing her. And you think, well, well uh, classic one, Lazarus. Yeah, yeah, Jesus weeping at the tomb of his friend, like, angry about what's what's going on mm. to him. If heaven was the destination, you'd be pretty ticked off. Mm. Why have you resurrected me? I was yeah, with God. Yeah, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah, yeah. I was in a jacuzzi with <laughs> yeah, angels. You know? What are you doing? Why? And, and for me, I remember one Easter reflecting on that. I was like, that's, yeah, if Jesus cared about healing people and feeding them and raising him from the dead, it shows you that this is the, this is the space that we're meant to be in. Mm. We're meant to be whole and restored. And so when Peter yeah, talks about this sort of annihilation language, uh, I read it as purifying. So mm. fire in the Old Testament had an element of yeah. like not just <laughs> wiping things yeah. away like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. It was a way of purifying. Yeah, yeah, of purifying. So when the elements are going to 
be purified as a way of like, well, God's gonna. I see it as a really like apocalyptic way of describing God, like, <laughs> cleansing everything, get, gonna get rid of sin yeah. and evil and demons and all all that terrible stuff that's in yeah. this world that pollutes it. Let's get rid of it and have things cleansed and made whole and re- renew. So, yeah, I don't know what the mechanics of that will be like. Um, yeah, it's a yeah. tension of renewed and replaced. Like yeah. it's, there's not not promising a replaced earth, not no. promising a replaced body. I love that. Such a striking thought mm. of Christ coming back with holes in his hands. Mm. And there is, yeah, I don't know, some... Mm. Uh, yeah, there's I mean, a, scars is yeah. a very striking word. Mm. You know, some evidence of the history yeah. of what has gone. And, you know, if, if Christ is... You know the, the 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 first Adam in some yeah. ways, you know, but also the last Adam. There is this idea. It's like, well, Adam is like Adama, the mm-hmm. earth. He's a representation mm. of what's going to happen to the earth as mm. well. Therefore, it's important to care for the earth mm. now, even though it's going to be restored yeah. and renewed, not replaced. Yeah. There is still value yeah. there, and ultimately, yeah, creation care is fulfilling the you know first commission. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, that, then that there's. God gives. And particularly, um, yeah, there's a lot of the, again, in that same book by Chris Wright, he has a whole chapter on environmental ethics through the Torah. Yeah. And there's a lot there. Yeah. yeah. If you actually unpack it, you're like, there's a lot here about yeah. God saying, like, hey, you need to make sure that this land like remains fallow in this yeah. year so it can recover and rejuvenate. Yeah. yeah. There's this, the land is in some ways personified. Yeah. Um, if you sin, it's going to vomit you out. Yeah. There's, you yeah. can't spill blood into yeah. dirt, like Cain's blood yeah. crying out. There's, yeah. yeah, there's a how you treat animals. You don't muzzle the ox. That's yeah. so. There's this yeah. tied in there is this this idea of land. It's not just there to be kind of used and abused, and yeah. it's to it is to be used, but in a way that's yeah. I guess for lack of a word, sustainable. Yeah, I mean, we in a way even that see reflects it. God. Yeah, He's no, there. absolutely. I mean, we even see it as as Christ is crucified, as His you know bones are broken, or not bones, sorry, I should say, but His flesh is mm. you know broken. His you know the earth breaks. There's an earthquake. Mm. You know this idea that once again it's the earth is echoing out. Yeah. You know this atrocity, and mm. I think that yeah, that this is this is I think so informative to. Let us know once more that, um, you know, caring for our bodies through exercise, through Mm. eating well, (laughs) you know, through sleeping and resting well, um, all of these things are deeply spiritual. Mm. And it's not that we deprive our bodies so that we are more spiritual. Mm. It's that we continue to love (laughs) and care for our bodies and the environment around us because it is is part of what it means to be truly human and truly an image bearer of God. I can't remember who wrote it. But someone in some commentary said Jesus ate and drank his way through the kingdom. You're like, yeah, it's actually a good point. Never mm. really noticed that till reading that quote yeah. about yeah, he <laughs> spends yeah. a lot of time feasting. In fact, so much so uh, they called him a glutton. Yeah, <laughs> the Pharisees, why aren't you feed? Why aren't you fasting? Yeah, too much feasting. Yeah, um, absolutely, so. absolutely. Mm. Well, look, I think it's it's a powerful reminder of what it means to be an image bearer of mm. God to what it means to be, yeah, people who worship a, a resurrected God. Mm. Um, Mitch, we're, we're wrapping up our treasure series yeah. this Sunday. It's been a little, I, I don't know, excursus out yeah. into the, yeah. Yeah. the, the baptism cycle of, and, of oh, baptism Easter. and yeah. Easter. Uh, but we're back to wrap it all up. Where you've kind uh, of already given us a little yeah, bit yeah. of a taster, but what are we looking at um, this final Sunday? So, yeah, the title of the sermon is Practice Resurrection which is based off Wendell Berry's poem, poem called The Mad Liberation Front. Um, that's how it ends, like Practice Resurrection. And mm. Yeah, Eugene Peterson used that expression for his book, Practice Resurrection. Mm. That while Eugene Peterson looked at Ephesians, we're going to look at Peter. And mm. tying on that idea of treasure is that, yeah, we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, mm. or fade away, kept there in heaven for you, um, mm. who have shielded by faith. Mm. And yeah. So even though that idea of not just like it's up there in heaven Mm. that's not where the heavenly rewards are but the idea is that our salvation our hope is protected it can't be stolen Mm. and we're going to suffer trials and grief just like jesus did Mm. but we keep persevering and so that sort of we're entering as like that's what practice resurrection looks like as we yeah particularly come off easter to be reflecting upon that and Mm. walking in the steps of jesus love it so So good Mm. well thanks for the chat right thank you everyone see you on sunday bye 
thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to help others discover this channel. Check out the description if you want to find out more or get in touch with us at the Centre Dural. But in the meantime, praying for God's hand over you as you continue to step into everything Jesus has in store for your life. Be blessed.